You good? Good. All right, good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Brian Brown, Lieutenant with the Austin Fire Department. I work with the Special Operations. This is my right hand man, Aiden Bradley. Uh, any questions, please direct it directly to Aiden. All right, so uh, anyway, today I'm here to provide a little period of instruction on spot T or temporary spot T. Uh, it's one of the shores that we use as an uh, initial uh, uh, application to provide a safe haven or a safe area that we can work in so we can build a more substantial shore in that place in the event that there's a structural collapse. Okay? But before we get into the nuts and bolts or the minutia of just the spot tee, let's go over, I feel like it's, it's prudent for us to go over some of the shoring principles so we can understand why we use the shore and how it functions at the shore. All, right? All shores, regardless of what type it is, whether it's exterior or an interior shore, follow the exact same principles. And the principle is a funneling principle. Okay? And so what I've done is I've driven, driven, uh, drawn on the board on this side, I know what that funneling principle is. Okay, So every shore that we build, with its components is doing one, you know, one thing and one thing only, right? They're capturing the instability of the, the structure that we're trying to, to, to shore up, everything from above. It's dispersing all of that energy or that connect or that possible energy from uh, the continued collapse into a header or into a wall plate. It's funneling it down some kind of post as I've drawn here, and it's redistrib uh, redistributing that weight or that instability into a sole, which then again is distributed into some kind of sound foundation, whether that's a concrete foundation, uh, cribbing or something like that that we put there, or some kind of substantial part of the earth, right? That's uh, not just sandy soil or anything. So all of our shores, regardless of interior or exterior or class, in some form or fashion are using the same principle, okay? So remember the funneling principle. Again, everything that we're gonna go over today could be found inside the SOG manual or the FOG manual. Um, anytime that you go on scene or you respond to a structural collapse call and you're gonna apply any of these principles or build any shoring or anything like that, it's prudent that you always have that FOG or SOG manual inside your pocket. As much as I can remember and recall about all this information, anytime that I build or construct a shore in any manner at all, I always reference the FOG manual, okay? It has all the information you need, has all the values and weights that each one of these shores um, can carry. So that is your blueprint for anything that you're going to build in the structural collapse community. All right. So moving on from now, we understand exactly what a shore is doing in principle, funneling, tra you know, transferring, and redistributing the weight of the structure that we're, we're, we're stabilizing. Let's talk a little bit about different types of shores. Okay. First off, we have interior and exterior shores. Today, we're going to focus primarily on interior shores. Of the interior shores, we have three classes, a class one, a class two, and a class three. Okay, each one of these kind of gives you an understanding about what and how they're going to stabilize the structure that we carry. Okay, so first off, we're going to talk about class one, which our spot T shore falls into the category of a class one shore. Okay, a class one shore does one thing and one thing only. It stabilizes and carries the load or the weight of the structure that's unstable from directly above, distributes it through the post, redistributes it through the ground in a sole. Right, only from straight above to straight down. If at any time that structure moves left, right, forward, or back, that shore will fall over, the building will come down. So that shore is only gonna capture everything from above and redistribute it below, okay? A class two shore. A class two shore does exactly the same thing as a class one shore does with the uh, addition that it will fight the movement of the structure left and right or forward and backwards. So I've kind of drawn a square here and given you kind of an idea. So a, spot, a class one shore, spot T, will only capture and redistribute weight if that weight is being shifted directly above, straight down, okay? If the building moves forward and back or left and right, it falls down. A class two shore will carry the weight from directly above and be redistributed into the ground. In addition to that, it will fight the movement in the structure or racking in the structure from left to right or not both or forward and back okay so we've placed that in there and we're going to orientate it in a in, in a fashion that we're anticipating that the structure would only move in this direction okay so if we're worried that is sitting in this room this building could move from right to left my posts are going to be in line with that movement so if it does each one of those posts interacts with each other, one's in tension, one's in compression, to fight that movement. Now, if the structure for any reason moved from back to forward, the shore would fall down, the building would fall down, and collapse would continue, okay? Our last one is a class three shore. A class three shore does everything that a class one, a class two, and a class three does, or a class one and a class two does, with the addition that it, it uh, resists movement in the structure in all directions, all right? And so a class three would be our, our uh, lace post box. 
Okay, basically we're building a big, wide, you know, uh, four foot on center maximum new column out of um, dimensional lumber. Okay, so we would put this inside of a structure where we were unsure or we had a good feeling that the structure could move in any direction, straight above to straight down, from front to back or from left to right. Okay, and so that shore itself will redistribute and fight all the movement in that structure in all, um, in all directions. Okay, so when this post is in tension, this one will be in compression. And so they all work together and are all laced and braced together to fight any movement in any of those directions. Okay, so but the point of the class today is to talk about the spot T interior shore. Okay, so one of the biggest things that we need to remember about a class one or a spot T shore or a double T is that it is only a temporary shore. It is not something that we're gonna put into the structure and continue to work or anything else. It's something that we're gonna place in, inside the interior of the structure to provide us a safe space where we can work or measure for more measurements until we can put a more substantial shore in there, whether that's a class two or a class three. Class two and a class three would, would be considered a more permanent shoring system for us to work in that environment. Okay, so a spot T. One of the, it, it, we have the different kind of components with the spot T. It's very, very simple. We can make spot T kits that are already pre-manufactured with everything except for the actual length of the actual post that we're gonna use to distribute that weight. All right, we're gonna need a header and a sole. Okay, inside that fog manual, that SOG manual we talked about, it has all the dimensions of the lumber, right? And all the pieces that we need. Basically it has a material list that you can go in. But I've written it on the board here. So we have a header and a sole. Both that header and sole have a maximum width. Does anybody know what the maximum width of the header and the sole is? 36 inches. Yep, 36 inches, right? 36 inches. It's very important that we don't make uh, our header and sole uh, more long or you know uh, wider than, than what's called for, okay? So all of these uh, shores that we have, they're all uh, engineered to, uh, to, to, the uh, to the teeth, right? So uh, they've gone to California, they've done testing and everything else, and they figured out 36 inches is the maximum. If we build a header with the spot T that's over 36 inches, we're basically you know, uh, gonna create a fulcrum and it's gonna tear it apart if one edge of it sees more weight than the other ones, right? So it's very, very much engineered uh, specifically for the, the measurements and allowances that we find in our SOG or FOG manual. So we have two, a header and a sole, both 36 <coughs> inches. Next, the work, the meat and potatoes of every one of our shoring system is the post. The post is what's gonna carry and channel all of that weight and instability in the structure. Okay, we have two full gussets, and gussets <coughs> are plywood um, pieces that are cut 12 inch by 12 inch. So a full gusset is a 12 inch by 12 inch piece of plywood that's used to secure our header and our soles to our post, okay? We have one half gusset. We have uh, two by four wedges and then our uh, eight penny or eight, eight, uh, eight penny nails that we're gonna use to kind of construct all this stuff together, okay? So the idea behind a spot T is it's something that we can put in, build around, remove, and move to the next spot. So we always do a leapfrog operation if we have to do multiple shores, okay? Or we can put it into the place, build our permanent shore around it, and leave it. But the idea is that we manufacture it in a way that it's very easy to de uh, deconstruct and move down to the next spot, okay? So all the components, one of the biggest things that we, most important things that we need to know, something that the book can't tell us, they can tell us like uh, known links for headers and soles and all that stuff, the most important thing that we don't know is the insertion point. The insertion point is the area between the top of the structure or where we're going to actually capture the instability in the structure and the floor, the ground, the foundation that we're gonna redistribute. So that distance between that ground, that foundation, and whatever we're gonna capture above that's part of the structure is what we call the insertion point. All right, when we're manufacturing this, this is the known or the unknown measurement that we need to find. Okay, so we do what we can to get in there with the tape measure. We measure from this point to this point, and that measurement gives us all the information that we need so we can continue or uh, complete the construction of the majority of the shore on the exterior of the structure. Okay, so we come in here and we know that this from here to here is six foot. Okay, so we've gone in, we've measured six foot. Now I need to put a temporary shore in here with a six foot insertion point. Okay, so we have other known measurements when dealing with this, we know that our header and our sole are made up of four by four posts. So each one of those actual dimensions is three and a half inches, right? I have a raw measurement from here to here of six foot or 72 inches, okay? Well, I have to make allowances to be able to fit my header and sole in that space as well. Plus the two by four wedges, which are used to charge underneath that post to make it tight and part of the actual you know, unstable structure. Okay, so I have 72 inches. I know I have to fit a header and a sole. 
right? So that's three and a half plus three and a half, seven, seven. seven inches, right? So now I need to subtract seven inches from my 72 inch post. And that gives me the space I need so that I can carry my header and sole in between that post, right? The other important factor is being able to slide wedges underneath that post that are resting on top of the sole and charge it into place to make it tight and part of that new, a new structural part of that unstable uh, building, okay? So two by four wedges, the actual dimension of the, uh, the wedges would be what? An inch and a half, right? So we're using that small side. Now, one of the things that I tell people when I teach this is that well, we can take uh, three and a half and three and a half, right? That's seven, That's, uh, uh, that, that accounts for our header and our sole. But then we have our two by four wedges, right? People will say, okay, that's another inch and a half. But I tell people when I teach this, in order to make sure that you have a nice, tight, clean looking shore, is don't take an inch and a half off for the wedges. But eventually what will happen is you charge them underneath the post, they'll overcharge. And there's only so much that we can continue to charge if the structure is moving and creaking and we have to like take up more space because we've charged something over here and it's created distance between our, uh, our header and our post and the structure. And we keep charging it, we can only go so far. The other thing that people don't account for is when we create these two by four wedges, we put them in a jig and we cross cut them with the skill saw. Well, there's a certain amount of material that we're losing from that wood. So if you just take off an inch for your wedges, they're always gonna marry up almost perfectly and it gives you enough leeway later on that you can continue to charge them if you have to uh, recharge them. So uh, all, all that being said, we have seven inches for our header, seven inches for our sole. And what I'm gonna tell you to do is one inch for our wedges, right? So that gives us eight inches. On top of that, it's just easier math. It's much cleaner, right? So we have 72, we're gonna take off our eight inches. We have all the information we need. We already have our two by our, our, our 12 inch by 12 inch gussets for the top, a half gusset for the bottom, okay? So as we go through and we start to manufacture this, all right? We talked about already, we have our 36 inch header, right? And we have our 36 inch sole. Okay, in here, that's where our wedges are gonna go, we've taken off an inch. Our post goes, oh, that's not right. right here, okay? So we could put all of this together, just like it sits right here, all right? And be short in, okay? But if there's any movement in the roof at all, what's gonna keep this header from just falling off? The gusset, right? And so on the top of this, we have our full gusset. So it's gonna be a 12 inch by 12 inch gusset, right? And so it's a very specific uh, nail pattern, right? It's inside your fog manual. And so never drive a nail without referencing that fog manual to see what that nail pattern is supposed to be, okay? So we have two different size nails that we use when we're in the shoring world, right? We have 16 penny nails and eight penny nails. What's a really easy way to remember when we use smaller nails? Small nails, small dimensional lumber. Small dimensional lumber, small nails. So anytime we're using plywood, we're gonna use the smaller nails. Anytime we're, we're hammering large dimensional lumber that's two by four and bigger into other large dimensional lumber, we use 16 penny nails, bigger nails, right? And so all of this can be tied together on the exterior of the structure, okay? So we're out, laid it on the ground, got our post, it's cut to the proper length, and we can complete the process of nailing these gussets on to our header and our post. And so as we pick it up, we have a big T and we have a gusset in the front and a gusset in the back, all nailed together. So all of this is one constructed piece. On the bottom, outside of the structure, we can pre-nail our half gusset on to our sole. Half gusset is six inches by 12 inches. So this is your six inch, this is your 12 inch, right? And it's got a pattern of four. Again, where are we gonna find where the pattern is? Fog manual. Fog manual, right? And so now we have our wedges, we have, and on the sole, we're only gonna have one gusset, okay? There'll be only a gusset on one side. And that comes into play when we talk, start talking about this being a temporary shore. So at this point, we can take it into the area where we're going to shore up the structure. One of my, you know, one of my partners, whoever, is gonna take that into place and push it up against the structure. I'm gonna slide the sole plate, the sole, uh, sole plate underneath it, set my wedges underneath that post, I'm gonna use a torpedo level so that I make sure that I'm plumb and level, right? We want that post to be as straight up and down as possible. And then I'm gonna charge underneath it until it's tight. Now, these are creating an inclined plane, right? So if we get in there with a couple of hammers and just go to whacking on it, it's, you know, they, there's a lot of force uh, being created by driving these two wedges onto each other, 
Okay, so you can lift the structure. So the idea is not to charge it as tight as you can and just bang it away until you can't bang it no more. You want to continue to uh, charge this thing until it's tight, in place, and there's no movement in the post. Okay, once we've charged this into place, the next part is to go ahead and finish up connecting this bottom piece, okay? In any shoring system, the connections between the posts, the headers, the wall plates is the vulnerability in all of our shores, okay? When they fail, this is where they're gonna fail, okay? So we wanna make sure that we always cover up every joint between dimensional lumber with the gusset. Anytime a four by four post rests on another four by four post, you're always gonna have a gusset in that place, or at least a cleat that helps to hold that connection together. What makes this a temporary shore is we've only gusseted it on one side, Right? Uh, a lot of guys want to come and, and drop a toenail in there, but the temporary shore is not necessary. Charge it into place, it's in there, it's plumb, it's level. We go out, we come up with whatever we're going to do to replace that. We come in, build that, and then we can knock the wedges out of there, and now we have a spot T temporary shore ready to go to the next spot so that we can continue shoring. And we just continue to do that uh, until we felt like we've constructed enough shoring to hold. The, uh, the uh, you know to to negate the instability in the structure, okay, and that provides us all the area that we need to work in. So this is a spot T uh, interior shore. Um, again, the SOG manual is the best reference for any of this information. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Are you able? I have a yep. Once you remove that class one spot T, are you able to reuse the wood again in another spot or no? So this. Top part of this spot T is gonna stay just like this. It's gonna look like just like this. We're gonna deconstruct this. So basically we're gonna take the wedges out so it's loose. Somebody's gonna grab that. We're gonna to go to the next spot. So the captain says, this is gonna be the next spot that we shore. You're gonna walk over. And as long as that post is the same, the insertion point is the same there as it was here, we can just reuse that entire thing and, ch and charge underneath it. If it's not, then we may have to. And just because it's a spot T and we, uh, we're just referencing using one, it doesn't mean that I can't get this insertion point, drop this in here, and while we're finishing this one up, somebody can't be six foot away measuring for the next insertion point, making sure that this post is gonna work or just building the second spot T short. We can build as many of these as we want. The idea is that this is used so that we can go and build around it, okay? Um, and the idea is that this is just providing us a safer space to work inside of a, un, you know, uh, uh, a, uh, Un, I can't even remember what the word is now, unsecure structure or unstable structure at that point until we can build either a class two because that's what it needs or a class three. Uh, but that's, you know, and we could call, the structure could call for us to build four of these before we go in and build the permanent one. So if we're gonna do a lace post box here, Cap may say, give me uh, eight feet away from each other in a big square, give me four spot T's. And then in, that, in, the, in the middle of that space, we build a lace post box. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Does anybody else have anything? Are we always using dimensional lumber for this or is there any other tools in the toolbox? Yeah, well, so we also have two trailers in the Austin Fire Department that have Paratex struts, okay? So we can construct all of the same shoring systems that we use out of lumber with Paratex shores, okay? One of the things to keep in mind is number one, Paratex are very expensive and at some point we have to remove those from the structure. And that's why using these wooden, uh, these wooden shoring systems is a benefit to us. Now, the, the quickness in which we can shore up a building with Paratex struts is, is a benefit, right? But at some point, we're gonna have to remove those struts from within that, uh, that building. And just because we went in there through Paratex struts, rescued the people out of there, or did a search and found that there was nobody left in the building, doesn't mean that we did anything to fix that so that we can just pull our struts out, right? We put them in there for a reason. So uh, yes, absolutely, Paratech struts are a, an amazing tool, but keep in mind, if we feel it necessary to use them in structural shoring, right? That means that we're gonna have to do something to maintain the structural stability of that building before we remove them, okay? So inevitably, if it's a significant collapse and we use Paratex, we're gonna have to come in behind them at some point and build some kind of wood system so that we can retrieve our Paratex. Did that answer your question? Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, man. I thought you were my brother. <laughs> All right. If anybody has any more questions, that concludes uh, my period of instruction. After this, we will go outside and we'll do practical application using the skill sheet. Peace.